be, I, I digress as usual a little bit. Um, and uh, I, I have some late spring flowers. They're not all early spring flowers, but every flower in uh, blossom uh, taken is been taken in the springtime. <laughs> So at the end, I kind of go and point out some things that are coming that you should keep an eye out for that aren't necessarily so beautiful. So, um, and we'll uh, get going to the first slide. And this is maybe for some people, what would be considered a rather homely uh, plant, but this is one of our very, very first spring flowers. It is skunk cabbage and the image on the left uh, is when it's still in bud and then it opens up and it has uh, this sort of like egg-like shape thing inside of it. And it's called the, uh, the spadix. And this is the flower. It's like a little knob with little tiny flowers on it. And uh, so you have to look pretty hard inside once it opens up. And actually the, the hood part, the spathe, actually starts to sort of decay and fall apart when it's really in full flower. So uh, that is happening right now. Uh, my skunk cabbage place that I go to look is just about, uh, is at this stage. And it's actually a little late <clears throat> compared to some years. So skunk cabbage, and we'll move on to things that maybe not as fascinating. This is a fascinating plant, but certainly more, maybe a little more beautiful. Um, here's another very early spring flower, um, and I am at uh, uh, Kunimis Cove, walking along the beach, looking up. Last, this is, I should say that many of these photos were taken last year because um, it's a little too early to get the pictures I have this year, but it is last year's early COVID wanderings that got me interested in all these early spring flowers that we don't always take time to notice. So I was walking on the beach and I saw this little band of yellow and I thought, wow, it's awfully early for dandelions and they're in a strange place. And I looked a little closer, I walked and they go, what are those? Those are definitely not dandelions. They are in the dandelion family, which is the composites, which is a very large family of, of um, of flowers, but it's colt's foot. And it is a very early, this was late March last year, but notice a few things about it that distinguish it from the dandelion. First of all, its leaves don't come out until much later. But if I had leaves in the picture, you would notice that they are big and round, um, but they hug the ground, uh, but they blossom first and their stems have these like little scales on them and they come out of these like little nubs and grow out. It's really quite a beautiful, fascinating flower, which I had never taken note of uh, until last year. Now I went back this year and sure enough, right on cue, there they were growing out of the bank of the uh, little bit of a bluff at, at Kunimis. And there's the common dandelion, just for comparison. You notice that the, the stems are smooth, thin. If you've ever picked one, you know that they're hollow. The leaves are at the bottom, but they're, um, they're ribbon-like. They have all these little indentations. And they're not nearly as, the heads aren't nearly as rounded and I'll say fuzzy looking, but you know that's probably not really the right word, but. Let's see if I can go back, see how they sort of look. There's a lot more petals in there and there's a lot more sort of soft looking texture to the colts foot versus the dandelion. Now, what else is happening now? Oh, I was out at, um, at um, Robman's Hollow. This is very end of Robman's Hollow. Where I'm standing behind me is the edge of the bluff. So it's the very end. This field had just been cut. Uh, I kind of like this photo because you can also see that it was foggy that day, a big band of fog looming over the horizon. So I happen to know that in town, uh, which is usually not the case, usually it's reverse, in town was foggy, but out at, at Robbins Hollow, it was clear and beautiful. And in this newly mowed grassy rough field is this little tiny, little tiny group of 
crocuses. And uh, they were just so amazing just to be there. I don't know how they got there or why, or probably completely by happenstance. Um, they're very deep um, purple, as you can see. And I looked closely, I heard a little something and I looked closely and there was a green sweat bee. Now, there are so many bees other than um, bumblebees and honeybees or thousands of other very important pollinator bees. And uh, sweat, the green sweat bee is a very uh, common bee. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and I watched it for a very long time. I could not figure out, I'm sure there's a way how to put a little film clip in my presentation today. That's something to learn. Um, but if you happen to be on Instagram, I did post the Instagram uh, as the OVF naturalist this morning. It's a little film clip of this green sweat bee going among this flower. And, it, you know, it's just stunning. And you have to be on your hands and knees to take note. So here we have a, another yellow um, not dandelion, and this is another small yellow plant also, um, not in the composite family, although it's multi, uh, multi petaled. It's a very low growing. This is just starting to come up um, on the island. Uh, places where I already look for this, there's one or two um, blooming, but not the whole array like this one last year. Uh, this is called Lesser Celadine, and uh, it's a, in the buttercup family, which when you notice that the yellow, the quality of the yellow and the very shiny surface of the petals are very like buttercup. If you're used to seeing those, you notice they have a shiny uh, sort of feature to them. Again, low, the, the leaves are very low on the ground, uh, very curly and small. Um, over here, you can see them a little bit more, but uh, a wonderful little low uh, flowering uh, wildflower that you can find on Black Island. The, the trick is to find a place where it's been mowed so that you can see them, but not so mowed that they're not there anymore. And I did notice that one of my favorite spots was mowed a little too closely last fall. And um, I'm gonna be watching that to see if they, um, if they come back, as of yesterday, there was only a couple in there. So they probably are, I was probably just ahead of the game, but a beautiful, beautiful little yellow flower called Lesser Celadine. Right now blooming, something you don't think of as a, maybe, maybe you don't think of as an early spring uh, flower is uh, the maples and the uh, swamp. Uh, swamp maple is just a sort of a little subgroup of the red maple family, which there are many, many sort of slight variations on the red maple. They're all considered uh, red maples, but the ones that are really blooming now and, and are a little bit redder looking on Black Island right now, this week, are the swamp maples. The other maples that you might have in your yard are a little bit behind, not much just a tad, but they have these beautiful red flowers. And I was looking up into my favorite swamp maple, trying to see if I could get a picture. And I noticed, oh, there's even a nest in there from last year. And this is a really great time um, to look for nests because before the leaves and all the foliage come back, last year's nests start peeking up. And if you're looking around, and it's all about looking around and seeing and looking past what you see every day for the unusual little thing. And that little blob in the tree is a little tiny nest, probably for a yellow warbler, but can't be sure. But the, the red maple um, flowers are stunning when you look closely at them. Uh, and they are, obviously they're quite red and they have these beautiful, you know, these are the, anthers and the pistols coming out, these little yellow parts, and uh, just gorgeous. And there we have the nest a little bit closer, mixed in among all, all the flowers um, up there. I could not get stop looking at the form in the pattern of the bare branches with the, uh, with the red maple flowers uh, throughout in that little, that little nest up there. 
And just another quick look here is um, a very close look at one of the buds before it's really opened up too much. Yes, a few of the these um, parts are, are coming out showing yellow, but it's a pretty tight red still. And, um, and here it is, because uh, of course I had to bring a little bit home. Um, here it is after one day, uh, it really sprouted out and it looks like, oh, I don't know, little red satellites with these beautiful bobbing yellow, yellow pieces of pollen. So if I start coughing at any moment, it'll be because I have maple pollen floating around the inside of the house. <laughs> but right now, this is what to look for. Uh, the red maple flowers are quite beautiful uh, and probably not something you're used to looking for. Another, one of my favorite uh, native shrubs is the high bush blueberry. And um, we're not quite to its full bloom yet, but this is the typical form of a high blue bush blueberry, very crooked and likes to be in sweat soils. Uh, it will get, before it blossoms, the buds will turn bright red and swell um, so that it can look like, and, and these are not the same plant. They're de, I mean, it's the same species, but two different individuals. Um, um, but this red is can be very overwhelming. Um, and of course, there's a great piece of, uh, of um, bittersweet twining around as if it's holding it back. Um, so <laughs> again, from last year, but before they turn red, the buds are tight. This is how, this is the, form, the stage they're mostly in now. Um, right now, they're uh, budding up their yellow and then they turn red from the edges out and then they um, turn even redder. And I don't, I'll, I have one here. I'll try showing it at the end of the presentation. Um, but they, the, they're just starting to bud, but when they bloom, they're beautiful. They're these little sort of, they're in the heath or the heather family and they're blueberries. All the blueberries are in the heath family and their flowers are sort of like a little upside down base. Um, and you, they're quite gorgeous. Uh, they do produce blueberries that are edible, um, but usually the catbirds get them a long time before we do. But there's a, uh, a nice close up of, the, uh, of a typical heath flower. And this happens to be the high bush blueberry. And within, they're budding now. I would say if it stays warm, within two weeks, we'll be at this stage where they're, they are uh, blooming. And again, I, yeah, I guess I can't say enough how beautiful I find these little tiny unexpected little specters. Now, not all of my um, photos here, most of them are wild plants, but not all of them. This is myrtle or vinca. Uh, the, 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 the more domesticated plants that you might, that I'm showing are because I found them in the wild. So they've escaped like the crocus um, earlier and myrtle. Uh, here we are. But again, a beautiful flower when you look at it, it's a very low kind of um, growing cover plant really. And the earlier picture, let me go back. This is, I took this more for the, for the texture in the background, those beautiful uh, needle, pine needles uh, and the, and the uh, myrtle, the vinca coming up through them. Uh, always a welcome sight and a very early, this is happening now. Uh, they're starting to bloom. This week, lots of things started to say, oh, there's one there. And, and within probably the next week or 10 days, they'll come on to their full full on force. So this is a good time to get out there and look. Black Island's usually a little bit farther behind than the mainland. So you may be seeing these um, in Southern uh, New England or, or Rhode Island already in greater quantities, but... Um, but it's always something to look at. And again, it's the form. It's this wonderful little sort of tube and then branching out of this periwinkle or which is also called periwinkle, but myrtle or vinca. Uh, here's another uh, really uh, more of a the home, homeowner's uh, um, 
plant is called Scylla. And I've, I've entitled this little group Scylla Gone Wild because it's left the garden and the yard and gone out to the field. And uh, throughout this field, you can sort of see this little blue haze. That is Scylla. And um, again, around this old apple tree that's struggling right now, uh, a it's just a field of Scylla um, growing up. This is on uh, Dunn's Cartway on Block Island. So if you walk down Dunn's Cartway, you'll be able to look over the stone wall and, and see this image. And there, there are blue haze on the ground, but when you look at them, they're quite beautiful. Um, they're little tiny, deep blue. Um, if you hold one up against the stone wall, you can make it look even more beautiful. Um, so, so silicon wild, back to the wild. One of the next things after we get through the, um, the high bush blueberry, one of the next early plants will be the wild apples. And again, the island has tons of wild apples and I, apples are really well known for their hybridization. So you can never, usually you can't get an exact species and each one can be different. They can have white blossoms and pink blossoms and early blossoms and late blossoms. But I, right when they're budding, I think is when they're most beautiful. Although there's nothing to be sneezed at when they're uh, flowering, flowering either. So look for those in, usually I think the forsythia, uh, which I did not include in this presentation is followed by the uh, apple blossoms. Another wonderful spring flower that is tiny, which is why I put this photo in with the hand. And many of these, these uh, wildflowers that I've included are very small and low to the ground. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons they refer to them as ephemeral spring flowers. They come, they go, you may see them, you may not. Spring beauty is a um, uh, beautiful little tiny plant. It's it's various shades from, it can be very pink to white with the pink um, pink centers that you're seeing here. Um, and, and I found this little tiny patch of spring beauty uh, in the maze or in Clayhead um, a few years ago. And I think it was 2015, so yeah, five, six years ago. And I didn't know what it was. And I checked with um, the botanist at the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. And she knew right away it was spring beauty. Lots of people are familiar with this. Um, but it was the first time it had been recorded in Rhode Island in 174 years, which is pretty stunning when you think about it. Um, now, after posting this picture, um, many people came forward and said, oh, yeah, I have that. Or, Oh yeah, I've seen that in our little woodland. Most of those people said, yes, I love that plant. We brought it from my home in New Jersey or we bought it from our home in Connecticut or it was something they loved so much in their woods that they brought that to their yards, which is why they see it. But I don't think it had been found in the wild, uh, apparently, uh, at least not reported. It probably had been, but not reported. Um, but it is, um, it blooms from March to May. Where it blooms in uh, Clayhead, it's always May. I've never seen it as early as, even as early as April. Uh, but I was recently at its little spot, clearing away the pine, pine cones and the sticks so that it would have a, um, so I would be sure to see it. Um, it's, it's, here's some close-ups done by my friend, Kurt Milton, and just the, the daintiness of these beautiful pink veins and again, the, um, the flowering parts, just, just gorgeous. Uh, it is a, uh, a bulb plant. Of course, these are all perennials. In other words, they just keep coming up. You don't have to replant them, but this does grow from bulbs and it is, uh, deer do like it. And the bulb is very sugary, um, a sweet high in car, uh, carbohydrates. And many places in the South where it grows prolifically, um, people will forage for the bulbs of spring beauty. Um, 
uh, and use those little bulbs or tubers um, as a food source. I can't imagine eating this flower. It is just too beautiful. And I only know of one place on Block Island, but if anybody ever knows or sees it, many of these plants, I'd love to hear about where they are other than um, you know where you may see them because uh, I'm sure they exist in other places. We just don't know it. But um, again, I think it might be one of my, well, you'll probably hear me say that many times. This is one of my favorite spring, tiny spring ephemerals. After the apple blossoms and you take a look for the spring beauty, uh, the next flowering plant is gonna be beech plum. And uh, beech plum is like apples, they're all in the rose family. Um, they, their flowers grow along the stem. So their, their branches, their stems, their, their branches, I should say, look very fuzzy with, with um, blossoms, like a, a tail of a cat or something like that. But that's how to find out where they are. So when it, you see this, and nothing else is usually blooming at this time, it's a low plant with these uh, branches that are just, I guess I'm too much of a birder. I go feathered with, with flowers. That's probably really not the right term, but this uh, sort of branch of, of, um, of, uh, of flowers. And those are beech plum. And they, you see them on the backside of dunes or in very sandy kind of harsh environments. And they're meant to do very well in the dunes. You can see that they come out just about the same time as the poison ivy starts to leaf out. So be careful when you're out observing beech plum. As beech plum matures, the, they pinken. So this happens to be a giant beech plum at someone's house. Um, and you can start to see the hint of pink here and in this one. So when they start to pink, they're really starting to uh, decay. And pretty soon all the petals will be down. And each one of those flowers has the potential of becoming a beach plum. And if you're familiar with beach plums, you know that they are there are good beach plum years and bad beach plum years. And there are far more bad beach plum years. So it's a rare end of summer that you can find a big sort of cache of, of beach plums that are um, bearing fruit. But they are, uh, it just, I think a lot of it depends on what's around to pollinate at the very time that they need to be pollinated, which is relatively early spring. <clears throat> um, and beach plums, where is a good beach plum plant on Block Island is uh, kept a secret and coveted almost as much as your best clamming spot. So uh, be careful when you ask somebody where's a good place to get beach plums, you might get a red herring as an answer. But if you keep your eye out in about a week, no, sorry, about three weeks to four weeks from now, and take a mental note, even write it down, and then you'll know where to look at the end of our August and September for, for the bounty of beach plums. Shortly after the beach plums, or maybe it's just starting at the same time, you'll start to see blackberry blossoms all over the island. Um, and you have the buds on the left and the blossom on the right. And again, we think of them more about their thorny nature or their big arcing came, uh, canes, or even about the, uh, the fruit itself. But looking at the blossom, even in bud or as a blossom, it's, uh, it's a stunning little flower. Um, the blackberries come first, which is the photo on the left. And the photo on the right, is multiflora rose and they will start to bloom before the blackberries end but blackberries are definitely ahead by about a week of the multiflora rose um, of course there's huge overlap but one, if you're ever in question is that a blackberry or is that a multiflora rose you only need to look in the center if it's yellow it's a multiflora rose if it's either green or really, you would say no color, then it's a blackberry. So that's something to keep an eye out for as the sort of late spring goes along. 
another sort of mid to late spring is a wonderful plant called the blue-eyed grass. This likes to be uh, damp places, open like a pathway near, if you happen to have a pathway near a high bush blueberry, you're very likely to find multiple, I mean, uh, blue-eyed grass coming up. And it's not a grass, it is in the iris family. And I'm afraid I don't have any close-up pictures. These are difficult to photograph because they're really so tiny. Um, but you can, they will come up and uh, there are many places. If you happen to be at Clayhead Trail System, any of the paths that are near uh, sort of a damp area, you're likely to find uh, the blue-eyed grass, unless somebody's already walked on it, in which case look to the side of the path. So this is another early spring flower, relatively small. It's called the Star of Bethlehem. It's in the lily family. I just, I became aware of this plant for the very first time last spring. And I can only say the good thing about COVID last spring was that it got me out walking to keep sane and started noticing all these wonderful spring flowers um, and not knowing what they were, um, looked them up and found out a little bit about them. So this is Star of Bethlehem. It's got some very distinctive properties for one thing, it, underneath its um, petals, which are white, its sepals or sepals are green. And you can see in this picture where they're still in bud, you see sort of a green and white stripe. And then in this picture, you, you don't really see it unless you look underneath. Um, but this is only, this plant is about um, four to six inches off the ground. Um, and again, this was in an area that had recently been mowed and therefore it didn't have a lot of competition. This is right at the beginning of the Clayhead Trail when you leave the parking lot in that first open field that you come to. Um, so this was taken in a little bit late April last year. So that would be the time to look for it this year. Um, and it is again, a beautiful plant. Um, again, here's a good one where you can see the bud showing that green and white striping and that the blossom with the green sepals underneath. Um, and this one uh, looks like it's towering above the ground and that's because I'm actually holding it. <laughs> so so a Star of Bethlehem, beautiful little tiny lily. Irises are well known, I think on the island, most people are familiar with the blue flag. There's the slender blue flag and the large blue flag. This is the large. And there's also in a few places, yellow iris. Now yellow iris for the most part have escaped their domestic zone, but this, is, this particular one is growing wild at the edge of a, of a wetland that's right next to a road. Um, and there, it's a little bit later, these were both in May, um, but the yellow iris can be quite beautiful. But where, as I say, there's the blue, the large blue flag, it's an iris blue um, and the slender are all over the island and there's, they grow, they like their feet wet and they'll come right up through standing water. Um, and again, anytime you're on a path near water in uh, late, in May, you're likely to see uh, the blue flag, either the large blue flag or the slender. And then the much more rare, you'll find the yellow iris um, in amongst um, the reeds. So I found that, uh, just a little aside, that yellow is a very difficult color to photograph because of the reflection. <laughs> I found that in all of my yellow plants, they, they, I don't get the depth that I want to get. So I need to figure out, well, I don't think photography skills are gonna be what I spend my time on, but I just muddle along and appreciate the flowers at the moment. Of course, then there's wild strawberries. These are gonna be in late May um, also. And uh, they're wonderful little low, tiny little flowers. And then they will produce, again, if you find an area that has a lot of them, try to mark it mentally. Because <clears throat> if you go back there in June, assuming 
the deer haven't eaten them, you will find lots of little tiny red strawberries and they are delicious. They're very sweet, uh, but they're the size of a little tiny nip of strawberry, not a whole big strawberry, but they have very distinctive leaves, um, the serrated edges, three, um, this one, ha you can tell it was done in the early morning, thus the dew drops, um, and this one a little bit later in the day, but wild strawberries, there are many, many more on the island than you might know. Just, and you probably, if you have a yard on the island, you very likely have wild strawberries in there if, if it's not a, if it's a sort of a wild yard as opposed to a, a mowed yard. And then there are the violets. Violets are, um, I find difficult to, to tease out to species. Uh, so I just refer to them as violets and notice how beautiful they are and leave it at that. But since I was doing this, I thought I'll make an honest attempt here. <laughs> so one of the things to look for when you're looking for violet, looking at violets is the shape of the leaves. There's a lot of variety in the shape of the leaves. Uh, in addition to the color and how they are or are not opening. Uh, so I believe this is the arrow leaved um, violet, although you can't, I don't have, I can't see the base of all of these leaves. So next time I'm looking, I'll look a little bit more closely, but the very ob uh, long lancelet, you know, uh, sh shape of the leaf. And these ind and the um, indentations certainly doesn't look like many other in the book that have leaves like this. So I believe this is arrow leaved uh, violet, as opposed to this one where you notice the leaves are more oval like. Uh, the quality of the blue is different. The white in the mouth is uh, more pronounced. The flower overall is just more open. Um, and that's a, it's not because the uh, violet on the left isn't fully open. It has to do with its its distinctive structure. This is normal open for it, where this is normal open for this, which I believe is the ovate ovate leaved again because of the oval. And um, they also the ovate leaved. They're very downy, the leaves, and you can see that in this one and along their stems as well. Um, they Downy, meaning they have little fibers. I, I want to say fur, but of course it's not fur, fur. It's just a downy nature to the leaves. And then there's the common blue violet. Again, a slightly different blue, um, a different, not so white, more yellowish center. But notice these leaves, they're very large, they're more ruffled, they're smooth. Um, and this uh, appears to be the common blue uh, violet. Now, if I was comparing colors, I would have thought that the first photo I showed here might have been this, but notice how different the leaves are. These are definitely lance-like shape. These are definitely oviate or oval shaped, and these are definitely not downy, bigger and rougher, thicker. So at least three, probably more blue, violet, purple violets. And there are also white violets. And uh, this, I don't see these as often. Uh, they do tend to like wetter places, and notice the photo on the left, it's not great pictures of the violet, but you can definitely tell the habitat that it is in. And then it is a beautiful, dainty, dainty little white violet with this wonderful purple streaking coming out of its, its mouth. Uh, the violets, again, a very small little diminutive uh, flower. Uh, but if you look closely, you can see amazing beauty in each one of them. Now, towards the very end of spring, we're starting to see flowers that I think of as early summer flowers. And that's where I start to digress a little here. Uh, there's the ox eye daisy, daisy, of course. Many of you are probably familiar with that. That is not as prevalent on Black Island as it used to be. Um, when I grew up, they were 
in every field. I think we mow our fields a little too much and too tight so that they don't do well. Um, but they used to be everywhere. And the, the Black Island School graduation, uh, they used to have in the back of the, uh, during the, behind the seniors would be a wall that was made out of a framework of chicken wire. And the kids <coughs> uh, would go and pick daisies and put them in that chicken wire mesh. Excuse me. Um, so that it looked like the seniors at graduation on the stage at the Black Island, at the Empire Theater were sitting in front of a, a whole backdrop of wild daisies. And, uh, but you couldn't find enough daisies to do that uh, these days. <coughs> Sorry. The other uh, little tiny or late spring, early summer, all summer plant is Deptford Pink. Uh, beautiful, and I, this flower, you know, is not an inch wide. It's probably three quarters of an inch wide. And if you look at, I wonder if I could do it here. Yes, you can see the little white speckles at the uh, base of the petals. But beautiful little flower. You see it throughout the summer, um, and um, that is the Deptford Pink. Um, this I'm just putting in there because I get a lot of questions about it at the end of spring. It's cow parsnip. It grows in wetlands. It's very tall, um, it, but some people are worried that it's this new kind of very toxic uh, plant called ho hog weed. It is not hog weed. As far as I know, hog weed has not made it to Block Island, but po uh, cow parsnip is in the same family, in the parsley family. Uh, it's a very tall plant, but the stems on the cow parsnip look sort of striped. Uh, on, um, on hogweed, they're speckled. There are, if you look at the umbels, there's far, there's probably about, I don't know, 50, 40 to 50 of each one of these uh, stems going up to the top of a, making a flower. In the hogweed, it is about a hundred, many, many more. Um, it's tall, but it's not nearly as tall as hogweed. Um, a hogweed can be eight feet or greater. And if you see hogweed, do not touch it. It is very toxic and acidic on your hands. Um, they both have very large leaves, but the, believe it or not, not so uh, this is the cow's parsnip leaf. The hogweed leaf is about twice that size. So uh, it all has to do with size, uh, the number of little flowers at the top of the head and uh, the sort of the features of the stem. And again, on this stem, you can see how it's sort of striped as opposed to speckled. So I get so many questions about this cow parsnip at the end of spring that I thought I would just put it in there for a reference point. And uh, we're almost at the end, I have a, uh, a, a trick. This is April Fool's Day, right? So does anybody know what flower this is? It's amazing when you look at this flower. It's the flower of the horse chestnut tree. And uh, it is stunning. Uh, when you look at the individuals, if you're looking at from the ground up and you just see the sort of these big cones of flowers when the chestnut, horse chestnut is blooming, uh, which will be uh, again, late spring, um, you'll just sort of think, oh, there's a, a bunch of white flowers. But when you look at them closely, uh, it's, it's just incredibly beautiful uh, and colors and shapes and forms that you didn't really imagine were up there. Um, and I think when it comes to the tiny flowers of spring, it's all about looking closely and seeing more of what you happen to be passing by. And with that, I thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions or go back or get into a nice little conversation about spring flowers. So thank you. And I guess I'll stop sharing. Pam, that was great. I love the photos. I know you complained about the yellow, but the photos were fabulous. Just thank you.
be able to mm. capture that detail. So I just had one question because we sure. talked about how um, a lot of sort of escape, you know, kind of are brought over different, you know, spring flowers that people like in their gardens. Is there a concern about, I mean, I know the, that we have a lot of invasives, but I was just sort of wondering about is there a concern um, about these sort of naturalizing out into more wild areas, some of them? I, I think it really is species specific. So mm -hmm. especially like some flowers, they are native plants. I mean, the spring beauty, for instance, is a native to this area. It's just that uh, it's been browsed and it's, its habitat has been lost. So you know, people bringing natives from another place, they're, if they're not suited, they won't survive in this climate. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if you go to the Carolinas right now, spring beauty is everywhere and they're much pinker. Um, so I think, um, you know, you always want to, if you're specific, uh, if it's not native to the area, you really want to try to confine it to, um, to your property and enjoy it. Um, I'm not one who says, no, you must never have anything other than native. I think that life is too short to be that, uh, to be that picky. You should enjoy what you enjoy, but do it responsibly and don't bring something. And we, and it's so much has been added. I mean, most of our invasive shrubs, you think of autumn olive, or you think of, um, uh, um, barberry. Most of those were brought from another country. They were used widely in the early part of the 1900s for ornamentation, for erosion control, and they've just gone completely mm -hmm. wild. And people do it unknowingly. There are autumn olives on Block Island that people brought for their yards and then, you know, innocently. Uh, but I would be trying to control autumn olive now and barberry, find another hedge <laughs> um, and just sort of be a lot more mindful about um, what you're, you're gonna bring to the island. Um, uh -huh. but I don't think we're gonna, you know, we don't have a flower police. And so we have to, we have to work on education and making sure people are thinking about um, what they might be bringing, but what they might be bringing might be something that we used to have and don't anymore. Um, so I guess enough on that. <laughs> I will say that the, uh, I've been working closely with Claire Stover at the Black Island Conservancy about uh, native plantings. And if people want to, um, a concept, Salt, one or both of us are happy to meet with people in their yards and talk about um, what would be a good plant to add or keep or a mowing uh, regime, you know, what would be the best mowing regime for a field or, and uh, we've written a few articles last year and I think we've, Claire's got one coming up shortly uh, where we're going to be talking about natives and invasives and um, which ones to uh, look out for. So keep your eyes peeled in the Black Island Times for that. And if anybody ever wants any, you know, hands-on in-person consultation, we'll mask up and march right out to your yard. <laughs> That's great. Um, Someone, uh, Anne had mentioned that she loved the swamp maple and the horse chestnut blossoms that they were, they oh, were good. new to her. So great. Great. So yeah. So if anyone, you can unmute yourself, if you have a question or comment or, or not, we can wrap it up here. Yep. Get ready to enjoy those spring ephemeral blossoms. Definitely. Definitely. And uh, I, our next zoom is the 19th and we'll be walking through the southern part of Clayhead Trails. And maybe some things may <clears throat> reoccur. If, if the uh, Star of Bethlehem is blooming at that time, it'll probably show up in the next walk as well <laughs> in a different capacity. <laughs> so. Great, I'm looking forward to that. And you know what other flower will show up in that walk.
Kim, you mentioned, was it in the paper about crazy as a coot or in an email mm -hmm. um, starting up again? Yep. So yes, the crazy as a coot bird walk, which I have had been doing tw twice a month on the island, um, had been suspended. And now we're doing it with uh, nine participants and me. Um, but I'm also continuing uh, the social distance bird walk, which is uh, something I started because of COVID to sort of replace the coot walk. But it has turned out to be so well appreciated and so much fun and a way to keep people in touch who are birding in their neighborhoods all around the world that uh, that will continue. Uh, it'll, and I'll do a, a walk, my entry for the social distance bird walk. If anybody's participated in that, uh, knows that there's always a report of what everybody saw on my entry will be what we saw in the coot walk. But you have two ways, if you're on Block Island, you can, sign up for one of the coot walks. Um, and if you're where you are and want to uh, send me your bird list for the social distance bird walks, which are twice a month as well, um, that would be great. I'd love that. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and if you don't know about that and you want to know more, I can send you a description. And I would say if you could just email me at kim gaffet at tnc.org and i can get you on the social distance bird walk yeah uh kim i also i just shared uh the link um for natureblockisland.org and okay. on there if you click on there's a when you open it up there'll be like you can go to the zooms or you can go to the bird walks and kim's coot flyer is in there for that and also the dates of the future walks. And just if you want to get a sense, if you scroll down all the bird reports from all Kim's, the people have like sent it to Kim and Kim compiles it, copies of all the reports are in there and they're fun. I'm not a birder, but I, I do like to go through them. <laughs> so I think they're quite interesting. So and the report is not so formal. It's basically oh, no. a list. Yeah. It's a list of what people saw broken down to what was seen from afar and what was seen on Block Island. So you can choose your venue and you can see the, uh, where the from afar um, were. And I've, I regularly, but not always, but regularly get a report from someone who's in Denmark, someone who's in Scotland, somebody's in England, uh, Oregon, Washington, Florida, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and love to add uh, some other states and places it's always fun and since we're all doing it on the same day uh generally i'm not quite as strict about that as some things but within a day um it's sort of what a snapshot in time throughout and it's a way of sharing and being together when we haven't been able to uh share and be together in person so i think people have enjoyed it and i turned out to turned out that i really have enjoyed it um being the compiler and seeing everything. Love to have some of you add coming. <laughs> All right. All right, great. Well, thanks everyone for coming. And Thank you. Can... All right. See you all soon. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. Enjoy the spring. Bye. bye.